Okay, welcome folks. This is a joint um, hearing with the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions as well as the House Committee on Healthcare. Um, Representative Houghton and I will be uh, running the committee, yep. managing. Um, this is going to be a meeting in terms of receiving some real high level information about how healthcare services are delivered within our incarcerated facilities and for our incarcerated folks. It's to really have an understanding of how the systems work within corrections, which is a little different than how it works in the community that we access our health care. Um, so from at the table here, we have the committee that really understands corrections, and then we have the committee that really understands health care, and we've got to meld that. We don't understand corrections. And we don't really understand health care. <laughs> yes, the house do. That's what you get paid right. for. We do. We do. That's how we get Just paid Just making light of it. So I think one thing we should do is start by just introducing ourselves, because this is the first time our committees have met together. So I am uh, Representative Alice Emmons. <laughs> Representative Lori Houghton. Representative Topper McFly. Representative Bobby Farley's Rubio. Uh, Representative Michelle Boslin. Representative Eric McGuire. Rep Troy Hedrick. Rep John Harrison. Rep Wayne LaRush. Representative Bob Peterson. <laughs> Representative Alan DeBarn. Representative Mary Morrissey. Rep Connor Casey. Rep Leslie Goldman. Representative Alyssa Black. Hi, Representative Tristan Roberts. Representative Chip Toriano. <laughs> so I think I was just as we were going around, when folks um, ask questions, please raise your hand. And depending who you are, <laughs> you can call on your yes, committee members, exactly. and I'll call on mine. Absolutely. Um, and I think what we'll do, we'll get started with DOC. We have Annie, and Annie, I'm not even going to try your last name, <laughs> Remisiano. And um, I think the best way to do this is, Annie, if you're fine with this, if actually you are overview, if there are questions, maybe people could ask at that point in time. Um, after we hear from DOC and have a dialogue and questions, we have with us as well Stephanie Ruckman, who is on our uh, screen. She is Vice President of Operations of WellPath. WellPath is the company that we contract, that DOC contracts with uh, to provide our health and medical and mental health services within our facilities. It is not provided by state employees. Uh, DOC has a contract. It's about a $30, $33 million contract per year. It's a three-year contract. Um, that they have just negotiated with WellPath, and the contract started in July of 23. Um, so we do have the Vice President of Operations for WellPath, and we also have the Deputy Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Health, Kelly Doggerty, who's also on screen. So we will start with Annie. So Annie, if you could introduce yourself for the record, Certainly. and then it's all yours. Okay. Uh, my name is Annie Ramdesiano, and I am the Director of Addiction and Mental Health Unit for the Department of Corrections. And I'm very happy to be here today with you and to start this journey of joint exploration together. Um, I will level set by saying a little bit about the structure of the Department of Corrections facilities, um, because I know some of you may not know them. Um, we have six facilities in state, five male facilities and one female facility. The female facility is terrible. No, a female <laughs> facility is in Chittenden, and we call it the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. And the other five male facilities are sprinkled around the state. Um, one is in Swanton, one is in Springfield, one is in Rutland, one is in St. Johnsbury, one is in Newport. I think I captured them all. Um, currently, we have about 1,350 uh, unique individuals who are uh, in, in our custody and currently housed in one of those facilities. We also, as some of you know, have a contract for an out-of-state correctional uh, system as well. And, but I know that that's not the topic of our conversation here today, but just for completeness of information. Um, as Chair Emmons discussed, we deliver all of the health care services, a comprehensive health care system 
through our contract and well pass. This is inclusive of all health care up to the point of specialty care and hospital admissions. So everything else is delivered within the walls, either by contract by the contractor or by services that WellPath contracts with. So if somebody needs a higher level of care or a specialty service, we use the regular consumer-based, Vermont citizen-based healthcare system, just like everybody else. We also experience the same wait lists that you guys do because we're all using the same system. And so what timeliness, acuity of care, et cetera, is something that we pay very close attention to because we're bumping up to that scarcity of resource um, that really is national, not just here in Vermont for certain types of care. That, having said that, and uh, correctional, uh, our correctional uh, facilities have infirmaries where if somebody needs infirmary level of care, they can be housed within that infirmary, which is obviously staffed around the clock by nurses. Sorry, I, can you, for those of us in healthcare, can you explain what you mean by infirmary versus Yes. What would not, so just <laughs> remember that we don't know the language. <laughs> right. There's a lot of language. Yeah. There's a lot of language, and I was going to yep. counter with it, you know, who understands corrections by who really does understand corrections. <laughs> so an infirmary is a different unit in the correctional facility that is staffed differently and is obviously geared towards supporting the medical needs of somebody who needs that level of care. So there are cells. And then there are medical staff, as I started to say, nurses staff that 24 seven. People obviously need that level of care for monitoring chronic conditions. They might need that level of care as a, um, as a holding place while we secure hospital level of care. Um, but it's typically a higher intensive, higher monitoring um, place in the institution. That said, there are also differences in the types of infirmaries and the robust nature of those infirmaries. So as you would imagine, um, like our facility in Rutland, Myrtle Valley Regional Correctional Facility, and our other regional northeast are much smaller. They house about 100, 120 people, and everything is scaled differently because it is a smaller facility and does not have as robust of an of infirmary, for instance, as a larger facility like uh, Northern in uh, Newport or Southern State in Springfield. So, Annie, let me interrupt because I don't want people to think when you said the 100 or 110, you were talking about the population of the whole facility, not the population of the infirmary. So of the infirmary, like it's in the St. J facility and the Rutland facility, how many beds do you have there versus how many beds do you have in the Springfield or Newport facility? I am unable to answer that question. Okay. But it's fair to say that there are less beds. Three to five beds. In the Rutland and Newport. And we can certainly get that information for you. I'm just less familiar with that since it's more in the healthcare arena. And my focus, as my title states, is addiction and public health. Um, so, but it's about three to five beds. Yeah. So um, just stepping back a little bit, when you spoke of uh, bumping up care level for uh, a condition that is untreatable within the confines of the uh, medical system you have working now. Um, so my question is, who makes the decision to send that uh, person, that individual, to special care? And then who pays for it? Is it part of the contract? <laughs> and how does that work? Can you tell us that? Yes, absolutely. Great. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the providers, sometimes, obviously, if it's a complex situation, somebody might have many comorbidities. The providers in that facility would make the decision that a higher level of care is needed. These people are obviously all licensed in the state of Vermont. Um, by obviously they're a medical provider, they're, they're licensed by the medical board of Vermont. Um, and then other people who have other types of licenses might be licensed by our Office of Professional Regulation. But they all hold their own licenses and operate within their scope of practice. 
and then operate as per the contract and the state laws and regulations that this body has created for us to follow in terms of the level of comprehensiveness of the health care that's provided. Uh, when somebody gets to the hospital, as many of you know, we've probably all been to the hospital, you may be actually admitted for your condition and you may not be admitted for your condition. There is sometimes a little bit of an abeyance there while the screening and the assessment is done. Because they, while they, in EMTALA, which is a federal law, people in the health community obviously know, means that you can't be refused uh, admission to a hospital or at least be seen at a hospital level. Everybody must be seen. Your condition may not be at that level of care. So that's for the hospital to determine. And again, we use the entire hospital system of the state of Vermont, just like everybody else does. There's no separate forensic health care in the state. Sorry, I, so when I, I finished the Yes, I wasn't sure if you were done. Yep. Yeah. So the financial piece is that if somebody is actually admitted to the hospital, then their health, their health care is activated, and that is what pays for that service. It has happened in the past that while most of our incarcerated individuals have Medicaid or Medicare, sometimes a family does hold Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance and it covers the whole family. And then sometimes I do get letters from incarcerated individuals saying, Annie, I'm so concerned. I just got a bill for $500. I don't understand why. I'll have a discussion and their diabetes got out of control because they didn't take their medication. They didn't need to be admitted. And then when we do the deep dig, it's discovered that they do have Blue Cross Blue Shield, and that was actually their hospital um, payment. Thank you. So we have we actually have a healthcare member that's on screen, um, although we don't see her on screen. So Mari, if you can hear me, you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. So I have two questions. One is for continuity of care for the individual. Um, does any health care provided within the correctional system, um, does that, that person's um, case get and um, any events and treatment get communicated to the person's own primary care provider? So when, that's one. the first question. And the second one. one is, um, can you, I, I, it would help me to have more specifics about treatment within <clears throat> the infirmary and Using an example, uh, someone has um, COVID or someone has pneumonia, so the um, they would come to the infirmary and they would be evaluated and assessed by someone, a licensed independent practitioner who holds either a nurse practitioner or a physician or a PA, um, someone that can um, assess and um, prescribe. Um, within the infirmary and can they also, can the infirmary in provide uh, intravenous infusions? Ari is a nurse. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know. so, you know. I that uh, Thank you so much for your question. So the first one again was about continuity of care and um, has corrections and institutions we all work together for MNs that was during Act 176, so that was 2018. We created legislature like legislation, and I believe the number is Act 135. And I don't know, me too. It was I don't know, we um, Specifically to your, to your question, um, so continuity of care happens um, at intake, when somebody's booked into a correctional facility, and then it also happens if the individual assents to it at any point in time. And that's basically the essence of what that law says. So that happens in a variety of ways, just to flesh out my answer with a couple of examples. So upon booking, we have a very robust uh, interview called a receiving screening. This receiving screening has even been by Dr. Levine. And it's the typical set of questions that you would get if you are going to see your doctor in the community. It's incredibly long. Um, it takes about an hour if you're able to have a rapid um, recall and answering of questions. It covers a lot of different bases. 
part of the initial questions is about medications, conditions, previous hospitalizations, including psychiatric hospitalizations and the like, so that we can get uh, also um, allergies, because obviously these are all top issues to make sure that we know the answers to, to ensure that person's safety is as close as them coming into the door. Um, part of that is asking about medications, active medications in the, in the community. And then the providers also can access VPMS, which is our PDMP, our prescription drug monitoring system. And so we can look at that. We also get releases immediately for all of the providers that they can recall they're receiving care from in the community. And those releases then allow us to talk to their providers. We can also call their pharmacy if they say, I can't remember who my doctor is. This is the pharmacy I go to. We can also call the pharmacy. So we have you know, a wide variety of avenues to gather as much information about this person as possible. And then sometimes there are special designations. Um, one is called SFI. Again, this is in Title 28 statute. Uh, the definition is serious functional impairment. People can be seriously functionally impaired, and we will learn about, about this uh, typically as continuously with their booking as possible, usually within the first 24 hours. And these individuals um, are people who have been just diagnosed with a serious mental illness in the community and who have been receiving um, a waiver, a Medicaid-based waiver, CRT, TBI, chronic rehabilitation treatment or a traumatic brain injury, uh, choices for care, which is another Dale-based type of waiver. We have built a very intricate system connecting many, many databases in the Agency of Human Services that one of my team members runs on a regular basis against all of the new names coming into booking so that we can discover whether somebody has one of these waivers. And then obviously that then gives us a whole other set of partnerships to learn about the person's conditions, care, and coordinate health care. Uh, another example I'll give is also at release. Well, actually, Anytime any medication has changed, I'll give you an interim example of care coordination. Somebody's medication can only be changed after, and this was Act 135, only after a face-to-face -face interview with that individual. And if an alternative treatment plan is indicated, then that's discussed with the patient. And at the same time, the patient can also ask for this information to be coordinated and communicated back to their community provider. Obviously, another release is required to provide that information. But we've tried to build it as porously, but obviously complying with HIPAA and 42 CFR 2 as possible. Um, but because we are such an enclosed system, it takes a lot of coordination and sometimes waiting for releases and such. So just to clarify, booking, yes. that's a terminology when someone is brought into the facility before they're admitted into the general population area of a facility, they go through a, a section of the facility that's called booking. They, they fill out forms also. So those medical questions and medical connections, those are done by correctional staff, or is there anyone from WellPath present as well, or is it just our correctional staff? And, and the information that is given to whomever has taken it is voluntarily given. It's a voluntary basis from the person who is being booked. So they don't have to answer. Right. So Chair Hammonds is correct. Um, they are held in booking. Correctional officers are <laughs> first lay eyes on somebody after they're brought into from the Sally Port, which is the transport area of the prison. Then they're brought into the booking area, which has holding cells. And there is a set of questions that um, correctional officers, booking officers, ask people. There are some mental health questions in that. Um, it's called the, the booking wizard. <laughs> And um, some of those questions are pertaining to suicidality and the presence of any suicidal ideation or behavior, there's a plan, allocution of a plan, any report from the transport team, which are often sheriffs and other people. 
So that begins the process. Then all of the other questions that I referenced that I call the initial receiving screen, and those are actually all done by medical professionals, not by booking officers. There's redundancy built into the system. So while we use the Columbia screening tool for corrections, um, which comes out of the White House School of Public Policy at Columbia University, they actually reviewed our directive on suicide prevention. Um, those questions are again asked by the healthcare professionals. And if there's a discrepancy, obviously there's more of a dialogue. But that's a very multidisciplinary process. If somebody says that they are suicidal or there's some evidence of that from the sheriffs or whoever brought them into uh, in booking, that is an immediate red, you know, red flag and full stop and an alert verbal and physical. Movement is given to the uh, medical staff for them to go and to start intervening at that point in time. So it should person's safety. But I didn't get to answer the second. I was going to say, we were just talking about that. If you can do that, and then we, we have some more, yeah. So um, the infirmary, yes, is staffed by medical professionals who can diagnose and treat. Again, up to the point of hospitalization, we provide all immunizations inside of the facilities. We get all the immunizations through uh, coordination, coordination with the health department. Um, we have... Um, we have, uh, we call them like vaccine drives or something like that, where, where we have vaccine um, vaccines offered on a regular basis. Um, many of the facilities offer these vaccines as part of the initial receiving screen so that we're addressing it right when somebody comes into the facility. Um, Paxlovid, all of those medications are available to the incarcerated people. Um, so again, it would be a medical person's decision whether or not I think we'll go for it. We'll yeah. I know a yeah, recent exactly. case, I, when I, I go to the facilities one week every month, I spend the entire week on the road driving to all the facilities. Um, this is part of my duties um, in recovery with, a, with an incarcerated individual based coaching program that I developed and then helped supervise and monitor. And one of the first questions I ask these men and women every month I go is, I would like you to tell me about your experience in all of the units, including segregation or the infirmary, because they do tours in all of the units, including booking. And I say, I I'm ready to take down a list of names of people that you personally, as, as a citizen of this correctional community, have concerns about. Don't tell me why. Just give me the name and I promise I will look into it. So through that system, I come in contact with a whole range of issues that I then report back to my team, back to, the, back to WellPath, our contractor, and we drill down on these cases. So a recent case was um, coaches at Southern who were providing coaching and um, supportive, compassionate, listening to people who were very sick in the infirmary at Southern. And they were very concerned with a man who had a very, very visible and visibly disturbing um, illness, chronic illness. And they were very, very upset um, by what they were seeing. And so uh, obviously we had a discussion about this with WellPath. Um, I looked at the electronic health record, this is out of my scope, but I was able to see and confirm, yes, this was concerning. It's a very complicated uh, situation that is be being co-managed by the hospital in Springfield, also Dartmouth, as well as our uh, WellPath contracted medical staff. Um, but <laughs> everything was known to all the providers. And again, the care was being coordinated across all of these systems. And you know, this individual is, is just very sick. So we have a lot more questions. Okay. okay. So. Wayne. Yeah, I'm write it down. Oh, We've yeah. got, we got <laughs> Wayne, we have Art, we have Tristan, we have we, John, we have John, and, and we have Connor. Connor. So you can write them I all got down. And, and then Topper. we got Topper. 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 That's okay. I'm just, I, I don't write it that way. So just, and thank you very much. That was very, very <laughs> thorough. I appreciate it. You're welcome. You mentioned that there might be instances where uh, an inmate may go to a hospital and not, not be admitted. Could you tell us what uh, kind of things would result in that? 
and also just on the flip side, could there somebody be returning from the hospital and not be readmitted back into the facility? Great questions. So I have to think for a minute. Um, sometimes people are sent to the hospital. The one that I see, so uh, WellPath provides us a um, daily um, overview of the system that is a multi-layered um, report of emergency department admissions, inpatient hospitalization, and specialty appointments. These are longitudinal lists, so we can also track patients' activities through this portal. I look at it because I'm a curious person. And our contract and my role also is to provide whole health. So I'm not just looking at mental health. We know that there are many comorbidities, people with heart disease and having people with heart issues are almost 100% likely to have some degree of depression. And I wanna make sure that all of that is being monitored and taken care of. So I bring that up specifically because sometimes um, people experience chest pain or let's say shortness of breath. So this is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. And so to be very careful and sure that we are not missing anything, that the team at that facility, the WellPath team will often take vitals and say, we're not really sure what's going on here. This is a rapid onset. This person's never had anything like this before, or maybe they have, so the picture looks slightly different. But nevertheless, we are uncomfortable maintaining this person in the facility, call the ambulance. So they take them to the ambulance. They may go to the hospital, an intake may be done, an intake interview, vitals may be taken, they may be put in a little room someplace, and then they stabilize. and. Hostilities to their gun. They want to get back there. They, any, they're, any they're, the hospital determines that they are cleared to come back. But does the, what does WellPath have to clear them to get back in? No, it is the hospital's decision. It is the hospital's decision. So I think that's a really good point. Thank you for putting, I, put, I, I italicize in that because we have our scope of work under our licenses and the contract. We rely on community-based care, the same care you all are getting. These independent doctors who are licensed and, 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 and you know, uh, providers in a hospital then make the determination, they order the test. We do not have any authority over that. It's independent medical autonomy in the hospital. And then they decide that they're cleared and then they are transported back to our facility. Or vice versa. Or vice versa. But they're admitted into a hospital exactly. or sent or to Dartmouth or sent to the UVM Medical the Center. So then our care managers, our WellPath care managers, follow that person's stay in the hospital to find out what's going on. Um, we work very hard to gain access to different hospitals' portals so that we can see in real time without have to, having to have verbal conversations necessarily, but obviously if verbal conversations are needed, that's, that obviously happens. Then the key there is the care coordination upon release from the hospital. This is also very difficult, and I just want to make sure we are all citizens of the state. We've all experienced this. I've experienced this personally. When you're discharged from the hospital, you were hoping that that information has gone into your electronic health record or has been communicated to your primary care provider. I can't tell you how many times I personally have gone back to my doctor and said, well, you know, I had my hip replaced and they're like, really? It's not in your record. <laughs> you know, so I mean, this, this, you no, you didn't exactly. It's like, yeah, you didn't see this. So, you know, so it's very difficult. And then it's a timeliness issue. Because when they decide that the person no longer needs hospital level of care, they're on the phone with the sheriffs or with the, with the correctional facility to say, take this person out of here right now. And we don't necessarily get the discharge plan before they come back. We're calling, you know, there's all that usual melee that happens in every single situation, whether we were a correctional facility or not. And I think that's- To find out what medications right. the person's on, 
we have to make sure that the medications the person was given in the hospital are actually in stock or we need to order them specifically for the person because medications are ordered by, by person. Is it formulary? Is it non-formulary? There are many different layers that the medical staff have to negotiate to make sure that all of this happens safely, timely, and continuously for the individual so that there's not a break in the action. And an offset of that is the transportation. Either right. sheriff department have to transport the person from the medical facility back to the incarcerated facility, and you have correctional officers. When someone's admitted to a hospital, you have two correctional officers there around the clock for them. So, and that's out of the general fund. That's what I was just going to ask. So that's that's covered by the contract with WellPath, or that's a separate? It's paying for correctional officers' yes. okay. salary. It's not, and that's not covered by the WellPath. Contract. Okay. No, that's out of DOC's budget. Okay. To, to address that, um, we actually, the commissioner uh, really looked at a lot of the data and um, issues with ensuring that we have the best coverage at our facilities. And so we've just instituted a new special team that individuals can apply for. And we've tried to uh, create like a, a SWAT team of, of experts who then go, they could be from the field, they could be from the facility to provide that hospital coverage. So there's less of an impact on each facility okay. because it can be a real hardship. Um, we've had people who have been placed in out-of-state hospitals because of the complexity of their care and the lack of the hospital Vermont system to um, provide them a bed, an appropriate bed. Mm -hmm. And they've been out of state for like a month. Okay. And we've had to have multiple teams, obviously of correctional officers 24 seven for 30 days Right. housing them in hotels, et cetera, to provide that coverage, um, safety and security of the individuals and the institution. Art, Art. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to understand who pays for the services they get. In other words, someone goes into the infirmary for something and needs care, and that's as far as it goes, doesn't need to go to the hospital. Yeah. That care, that person receives if they say they have their own private insurance. Yeah. Does it impact their insurance while they're at the, at the facility, or is that covered by the contract? Thank you for the question. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> so um, this is uh, federal law. Um, the Medicaid Medicare Act of 1965 excluded. Anybody who is in the care and custody of a state correctional facility or the Federal Bureau of Prisons from accessing health care insurance for the provision of health care, for the payment and provision of health care. So, Annie, does that also include their private, if they have private insurance, that is negated? There's okay. no insurance coverage no insurance when coverage. someone's incarcerated? It stops when yes. they're incarcerated? Stops when you're yes. Yes. It's on our nickel. It's federal law. It's not a state law. So, but I just want to clarify: if they are admitted, if they go to a hospital, then if they have private insurance, that that would cover that. Correct. But they obviously don't have Medicaid or Medicare. Eat, correct. I mean, so it is, or would they have Medicare, Medicaid if they are at a hospital? So, almost everyone who, because we have worked on this so hard in the state. Almost everyone has Medicaid or Medicare. Okay, so th so I need you to explain how that works, because so, you just said the federal law says it negates so access. What I, what I was trying to explain was almost everybody has that as, as their foundational insurance coverage before they're incarcerated. So when they are hospitalized, that is turned back on, and the hospital submits their claims through those health care systems, Blue Cross Blue okay. Shield. Medicaid, Medicare. Okay. But, but not while but, you're. But in. not while you're incarcerated. So the answer to your question, I just wanted to give that as the foundation because it's not a state law. It's not something the Department of Corrections can control. This is all part of another conversation that you'll be having in the future. Uh -huh. How states negotiate with the federal government about how they use the Medicaid and Medicare dollars. And we negotiate this with the federal government through something called the 1115 waiver negotiation. 
and we'll be having that conversation. We'll be having that. Yeah, but I, what's really important when someone is incarcerated, they lose all insurance. So all the health care that is provided within our correctional facilities is on the state's nickel. It comes out of the general fund because for the Department of Corrections, there's really no ability to match federal dollars. So our DOC budget is about 180 million. For health care. For, for years. For no, no. I mean, our yearly, yeah. our yearly budget for DOC out of our appropriations bill general fund is about 180 million for that. And of, of that, about 33 million is for the contract for WellPath, but there could be some other health issues there. Correct. So there's no, all of you are probably familiar with coding. Mm -hmm and coding per intervention. So you were seen by whoever, whatever medical care provider to have a diabetes check and there are all these CPT codes to do that. And as you know, may know, there are people who literally are part of medical practices, hospital services, et cetera. I mean, this is a job who do coding and workflows are built around making sure that the coding aligns with what's asked the patient to maximize the potential coding and reimbursement and charges to the health insurance. And then those costs and how the health, the health providers are reimbursed are all negotiated. Like you get your EOB from Blue Cross Blue Shield and it says the charge for this service is $750. And you're like, what for a band-aid? <coughs> and then it says, if a Blue Cross Blue Shield has negotiated this, they're only going to $50. Yeah. And the payment, yeah. you pay nothing. So we don't have that in our system because we have this one annual rate of 35 million times three for the whole contract. And then what we do is we have a per inmate per month cost that that contract extra is extrapolated from. Okay, the contract was well passed. Correct. So okay. the 33, 35 million dollars is an extrapolated cost based on a negotiated per inmate per month cost, which actually is not that dissimilar from like the platinum plan of Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's like $2,100 a month. It varies a little bit across each year of the contract. I can't remember the numbers exactly, but we can certainly provide those for you. But it's like $2,100 or whatever. But when you then average in like your other exposures of like a hospital copay or specialty copays or whatever, like depending on what your use of services are, it could potentially mirror close to what that top plan is uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, having said that, we're not billing individually. So people just put in six slips. Um, unlike you and us, who have to wait, like we'll have to call our provider and say, you know, I am, I am starting to get a tickle in my throat, or I have an earache or something like that, or my child's getting sick. Depending on the severity of the symptoms that you present on the phone, they're going to triage you and say, well, uh, your provider can see you uh, in eight days. In a correctional system, we have a much higher bar. We have to have a nurse see that person once the request is made within 24 hours. So there is a face-to-face -face visit with that individual, with a nurse, who then triages it to the right level of provider. Sometimes people say, I'm putting in a mental health slip. But when you talk to them, they actually say, I want my medication adjusted, I'm having symptoms, or I want to come off this medication, or something like that, which is not necessarily, obviously, I mean, I'm a mental health provider, that's not my scope of practice to do medications. So the nurse would triage that to, then to a provider who was having, who did have that scope of practice. But nobody's getting charged, we have no co-pays. Some correctional systems in other states charge people co-pays. Vermont uh, abolished that a long time ago. We didn't want any barriers to accessing health care because of financial ability to pay. So if they can put in a six slip, they get seen, triaged within 24 hours, and sent to the right provider. 
We also have for individuals, which is like this is like 98% of the individuals, um, chronic care visits. So every 90 days, you are automatically seen by the provider who's prescribing your medications. <clears throat> Now, that doesn't mean that you have to wait for 90 days. As I just said, you can ask for a provider. To be, you can ask to be seen by a provider, and you will see a provider within the 90-day period. Like that's kind of the cycle of how so I think I'm going to end this here because we have a lot more questions. But I do just want to say for the committee, those of us not for those not on health care, um, a person can always be seen in the community as well. So they can go to urgent care or they can go to emergency room. They don't have to wait eight days for a provider to call them back. I just want to be clear about that. Tristan? Is this, is this we're talking about all health care right now with Annie or your job is more substance oriented. So I'm just checking. I have a general question. All health care within our correctional facilities Okay. for our inmates. So I have a essentially a cultural question. Um, having, you know, over the obsession spent a number of hours uh, in different correctional facilities in New England and speaking with incarcerated individuals and families, uh, enough questions arose about this um, but I think I wanted to put it in cultural terms because, you know, all health care can be delivered by the book. And yet when it's bureaucratic um, or even oppositional or even punitive, then health care is not, you know, we've all experienced this. Incarcerated individuals sometimes report um, that, you know, the doctor is not going to see them. And they feel like that's, um, and uh, I'm saying this, of course, it's a general statement that this can happen, this can be reported, and it has been reported. Um, you know, I've spoken with uh, folks working in correctional facilities where I asked them about this, um, and I'll say including in Vermont. This is, I'm not throwing mud here, Vermont, because I've spoken to really dedicated healthcare professionals inside Vermont. But I asked, well, how would you characterize this, knowing that sometimes what you hear from inmates is a lot of grievances. So how would you distinguish what's really important about healthcare in this facility? Um, and I think one individual really summed it up well. They said, you know, we just don't have issues where it's sort of a trust issue or a punitive issue because I, and he's speaking as a doctor, I'm, always, I'm just out there. I, I'm interacting with, with inmates. I know what's going on. Uh, we know there's an, a, an understanding. And I was just wondering if you could sort of characterize or describe the culture that you observe. Sure. And I also, as I said, you know, speak to many incarcerated individuals every month. Um, so I have a lot of, I have a lot of contact. Um, I would say that one thing I don't think either the chair or myself have mentioned is that all health care is voluntary. You touched on this when you said in booking, people can refuse. So all participating in any, any activity, and this is all patient report, except for the information we can get from a PDMP, et cetera. But they can also say, I don't want you talking to my doctor at all. Um, so, and sometimes that does happen. People refuse to answer any questions, and it's very complicated. Um, I have a case that I'm sort of doing a root cause analysis on right now. Um, that was this type of a situation. A detainer who came in, a detainer is somebody who <coughs> has not been sentenced, so they're being held on conditions of the court with us. Yeah. Um, the average length of stay for detainers in Vermont is about three to five days. And during that time period, just a couple of bases, <coughs> typically somebody's Medicaid or Medicare wouldn't be removed or paused because they're in for such a brief period of time, the systems don't know that yet. So a detainee is a person who has not been convicted and has not been sentenced. They have just been arrested right. and sent. And, and they're waiting for and the court has determined that they should be held in our... For system. detainee and a detainer is the same thing. Same, same thing. thing. Sorry. Yes. Totally. But okay. they haven't been sentenced. That's the... They may be held on bail if they haven't met or another status hearing, et cetera. So they may be uh, not uh, back in court. court. So in the case that I'm thinking of, um, this person refused to answer any questions whatsoever. Um, but they actually were seriously mentally ill. 
I've come to find out, but since they would not participate and wouldn't sign any releases to talk to anybody, we have a way of knowing what was happening to them. Um, and that's so the same in the, same in in the general population. Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of culture, I think it's important to know that because I think sometimes we have ideas because people are in our care and custody, that means that things can be forced on them. And so that, that actually is a myth. The only thing being forced on them is their care and custody and the commissioner's care and custody, that everything else is not forced. You could so, just... can, can, I, can I follow up? I mean, I sort of, I heard in your response uh, an issue with sometimes someone doesn't comply, someone doesn't want to work with the provider, um, and some things can't be forced. Um, if that really doesn't cover a lot of cases that I've, where I've heard from individuals about, where they say, you know, I, I had an injury and it just wasn't seen and it wasn't taken care of and it got worse. Uh, so, and and I did seek treatment. And so, is there's there's, a, there's some things being left out here. So our system, as you mentioned before, um, of grievances um, is something that we obviously pay very close attention to. And I, I actually oversee the ones that are addiction and mental health related. The mental health chief, Colleen Nelson, uh, operationalizes the responses, but I review all the cases and to make sure that everything is happening. And I just need to know that in my school. And then we have reports every month by every facility where we look at every single category. And we actually can go back and look at the trends and the grievances to try to assess what I think you're, you're asking about. Um, I would say that most of the time, so I would say a little over 50%, um, but the it's not found. And people can to see also put in multiple grievances. So sometimes people see the same thing six times a day. It stays all at the local level. I only see it when it comes to the commissioner level. To the medical and their self-report is not always accurate. Um, in the grievance system, we have different ways of um, reconciling the grievance. Um, I would say of the ones that I oversee, the health ones, 99% of them are uh, rejected. Um, it is a disagreement that the incarcerated individual has with the provider. And we, since the provider has medical autonomy, well, I can ask evidence-based questions, cite research, probe and prod, and question the medical team making the decisions. I don't have any authority over them to direct the care because they are the provider. So we always say, continue to work with the provider. Our job is to oversee if they are not giving, getting the care that they want, just because we ask for something doesn't mean we get it. Um, that an alternative treatment plan that makes sense uh, in terms of medication or frequency of service, et cetera, are being met. Um, there are other categories of grievance response. Two other ones, meritorious in part or meritorious in whole. Sometimes I do see and agree that the grievance should be meritorious and whole because there has not been full communication with the patient and an alternative treatment plan has not been provided to them in a timely manner. And then that's obviously a continuous quality improvement issue to go back to well past. And then sometimes it's meritorious in part. So all I can say is that there are a lot of, there's, there, there can be a lot of discontent. I see that about dentures or dental care. Um, sometimes I see that about eye care. Sometimes I see that about other types of care. Um, but when we drill into those and look at the content of the medical record, they've been provided um, the standard of care that the state requires. All right, I'm gonna keep moving us along here. Uh, John. Then Connor. Then Connor. Term uh, medical professional, and you've used the term nursing. Could you elaborate and expand on what the contract with WellPath requires? So for we, staffing. Absolutely. So uh, sorry if I was confusing. 
No. First of all. And so we have different levels of providers. We have RNs, we have LNAs, we have um, LPNs, we have doctors, we have advanced practice registered nurses, APRNs, um, we have a psychiatrist, we have an addictionologist. So we have a different array of professionals with different scopes of practice. And the workflows to address not only the patient's um, path through our internal healthcare system um, is staffed at each point with that scope of practice as they move along their diagnostic and care continuum. So a medical provider is typically what we, when I use that language, it's somebody who can prescribe. And there are, uh, uh, there are many different levels of uh, medical professionals who can prescribe versus just assess. So assessment is done by a nurse. Uh, so they can do one level of assessment and an LNA or another level of assessment. So each, each, each person's scope of practice and level of information gathering and feeds into their medical record and then is continued to be triaged so that the right person can be seeing the individual to make a diagnostic conceptualization. And then ultimately the nurse would in consultation put in the order for whatever medications are needed because the prescriber has authorized it. John, it's just like you would have if you go to your doctor. But let me be a little more clear. Let's say right now I'm one of your facilities. Uh -huh. There's just an RN there. I shouldn't say just an RN. RN is there. You can describe <laughs> many <laughs> levels that are that are that. that are better. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. um, how do you access the next level of, of of care? I mean, you don't have these all these levels at every facility 24 seven. No, we don't. And then we also use telemedicine like the community does as well. So, okay. you know, there's not a psychiatrist at every facility. You know, there's one psychiatrist. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I thought you were going to say something. Um, and so it's, it's the provider's determination. It's their, it's their license that they would rely on and their training that they would rely on, that the symptomatology, the vital signs they're collecting, et cetera would need to be escalated to another provider in the, in the system. So through, well, so, what so through a well path, access to these higher levels, all available. Yes. 24-7. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yes. Okay. And I, and I just want to follow up with that point. All of these people you're talking about, when you say provider, if they're not in the hospital, the provider is a well path employee. Okay. Thank you. All well path employees or else a specialty care, care. just remember that was the other right. daily report I get, specialty care in the community. So that's another area that again, correctional officers staff those transports and they go out for specialty care, right. not just hospital patients. Okay. So then the care would be fed in to by the determinations from that community-based specialty care provider. Okay. So it's across the systems, inside of the system, Great. We're going to go to Connor. Sorry, I'm just making sure we get to lunch. Connor, oh. Connor and then <laughs> Top, And then Topper. Oh, Topper. And then Alyssa, and then Troy, and then Daisy. <sighs> Good job. All right. So, uh, <laughs> Annie, I'm going to admit, uh, like, every year that goes by, I become a bit more skeptical that privatizing these services is the way to go. And, like, for a number of reasons, right? Like, continu continuity of care. I think of like prison health services, correct care solutions, vital core, well path. It seems like every three years, there's like somebody different doing it. So I couple that with like, okay, like transparency. Could I submit a public records request to the head of well path for all their emails? I don't think so. And then like, you know, accountability. And I, I think we need to talk about it just a few weeks ago in the paper. It came out that the head of services for well path at Springfield, you know, had been lost their license or been suspended in three different states, you know. Uh, somebody came out and disclosed this, and they said the whistleblower was then fired immediately. So I don't know if she's covered under whistleblower protection like a state employee would be, uh, but it feels like information we should know. And then it was like, you know, reporters call, no comment, no comment from WellPath. 
And it just doesn't feel like, you know, that coupled with the increasing number of deaths, which I believe are unrelated, you know, I do believe that, it just doesn't necessarily inspire confidence. So I'm hoping you could maybe just go over the rationale. Like, is it money? Is it cheaper wealth path? Is it staffing, you know? Because I, I have trouble believing that if you could get a state pension, you know, for some of these jobs, wouldn't that be more attractive? So I'm hoping you could just give me a bit more confidence in why we're going this direction. <laughs> So uh, in my tenure, this is my 10th year um, working at the Department of Corrections. I worked in the community before this role. Um, in that 10 year period, I personally have been part of three or four legislative uh, analyses of, of your question. And um, in almost every one of those reports, um, they were conducted not by the department, I mean, with the Department of Corrections, but typically with another governmental entity and then an independent um, body. And the findings typically found that our correctional system, uh, because of its smallness, because of its uniqueness, we are one of six correctional systems in the country to be integrated, which means we have everybody, we have incapacitated people, we have detainers, we have sentenced people, we're the smallest and only one of six that are like that. Um, the scalability, the, the complexity, and then also that we have to staff our system, again, lack of scalability, to the degree that it needs to at each of the facilities, that it ends up being a very, very expensive proposition. And so all the reports have basically shown that the intersection of all of these staffing issues, facility operations issues, et cetera, that this is the least expensive modality. We always come up number one or number two in Pew research evaluations of correctional healthcare systems as being either the first most expensive in the country or the second most expensive. I mean, I hear everything that you're saying mm -hmm. and a lot would need to change um, for us to absorb this into the state healthcare system. And some of the assessments, and I'm happy to send some of those old reports to the committee for review, um, have estimated that it would be much more expensive if, this was delivered, if healthcare was delivered by state health state, uh, employees because of the very numbers, <laughs> et cetera. Okay, Topper. Now, yeah. um, we've been talking about people in the prison. Um, when a person's getting ready to leave, <laughs> can you just go over that? Just tell us what you do for that person to make sure that that transition works. That's my first question. The second question is a veteran uh, who has TRICARE treated any differently? And the Medicaid, do they lose TRICARE when they're in there? Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have, so I'm going to start there. It's, it's an easy one. <laughs> so we have, we have liaisons at facilities with the VA. So I've worked with that individual, yeah. you know, many of those individuals, and they come in and do enrich the veterans, and we try to braid and blend to take advantage of that system as much as possible but it doesn't cover any of the cost of health care. It's simply for preparation for release and to make sure that they know that the VA is still there for them and to create more of a community for them and, you know, support. Okay, you do that. That happens currently. But it doesn't pay for any of the health care. Right. Okay, so when the person comes out of the prison, you have a plan and you've made the appointments. Uh -uh. So, a little more complicated. So that was that was question number two. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. VA. Try to hear what's the third. Right. VA and try to hear. Yeah. Okay. With that. Okay. So that's yeah. my question's answer. So, then this goes back to understanding the correctional system, which is very complicated. So, as we discussed earlier, there are some definitions, and a lot of this can be found on the Department of Corrections website. Um, we give all of the legal definitions of all of the different legal statuses that people can have inside of our facilities. 
I'm sorry if I'm getting detailed, but this you, you do need to sort of know this to understand my answer. Um, we have the detainers, the detainees, three to five days average, not charged, not sentenced. Then we have the sentenced population. They're about 50-50. Half of the facility, 45, 40 to 50% are detainers coming and going very, very rapidly. We don't know when the sheriffs are gonna come, literally to the Sally Port and say, I want to take this person out, and they get released from court. Believe me, causing a lot of stress. Um, then we have sentenced people. They don't get any case planning. Detainers, no case planning, because they're in and out. We have no idea what's happening. They really, they're housed with us, but they're going through a court process. We ensure that they get the receiving screening, all the health care they need along the timeline. That's the same typically as the community, and then they're gone. So there's not a lot of discharge, medical discharge planning possible with them because they get released to court. Then the sentenced population, they do get case planning, and medical knows the window that they're going to be released. We have good time to consider. Um, Etc. those calculations, but generally speaking, as it gets closer and closer and closer, we basically know and we tee up who those, who, who's going to be released. Per the contract with the Department of Corrections, well path providers are supposed to provide comprehensive medical discharge, which includes medications and appointments for all of the active problems active diagnoses that they're currently receiving treatment for so that they have that when they get out. Now, they are provided bridge prescriptions. Individuals are provided bridge prescriptions for their medication, and it's called into the pharmacy of their choosing. But they have to go and pick it up. Well, PAP is also responsible for reactivating their Medicaid insurance or Medicare insurance so that it's active for when they go and they pick it up. Lots can fall apart with all of that, obviously. Um, from fax machines not working to all kinds of, of shenanigans. Um, the other populations that we have that you may not know, um, we have about on an annual basis, this happens mostly at Chittenden and at Northwest. We um, are part of the public health system for inebriates. So people who are inebriated, publicly inebriated, and determined to be a risk to themselves, and who are not admitted to the hospital for detoxification, are brought to the Department of Corrections. We call them public inebriates. Their st legal status is called protective custody. So they actually aren't charged with anything. They're not under, under court order. It's a separate statute. And we have to hold them for up to 24 hours to make sure that they have, their symptoms are reduced, their risk to themselves is reduced. We provide health care to them as best we can. As you can imagine, they're not in good, good state. Sometimes it's been determined by a hospital that they are not hospital level of care, but then whatever they ingested has become, you know, has become exaggerated and or amplified with the mixing of the medic of, the, of whatever they're on, and we have to then send them back to the hospital. But they get released for 24 hours. That's up to like 1,400 unique individuals a year in those two facilities alone. So that's another only the people. Then at Northwest, we have people who are called who are under the US Marshal Service custody and care. I think that contract goes up to almost 100 potential beds <coughs> across the system. And we do not, we have to negotiate with the federal system for their health care. So we don't have full autonomy over them. So that comes up frequently in my world with MAT. The Bureau of Prisons is still expanding their medication-assisted treatment programming. 
and sometimes they will refuse to allow somebody to become inducted or continued or switch <laughs> onto a medication because they don't approve it. And there's nothing the Department of Corrections and Vermont can do about that. So I just wanted everybody to understand that when, when you hear, and again, my team and the department is, works tirelessly to ensure that people are getting what they need. We don't want them coming back. It is not in anybody's interest to have them come back, but it is so difficult when 40 to 45% of the population is released at court. And then this is often what happens, that then we are looked to as having failed. And we can't ever disclose anything to the press about any of this, but we know that they were a detainer and they were released from court. And there was not really anything we could do. So that's great. I'm going to put a question out there that I don't want answered right now, but I would love at some point to connect with you on it because I want to get to everyone else who's been here is that um, what is the relationship between DOC, WellPath, and DIVA to make sure that as these people are being released, they get access to Medicaid or Medicare or whatever they need, something else? So that's, that's for another time. That's for another time. <laughs> Alyssa? Um, so I wondered what, a couple of questions, but very quick. What's the per inmate per year cost to provide health care? Isaac, I know there were three different costs for each year. I think per inmate per month, I think we started at $2,100 per month. Uh -huh. yeah. Specifically, uh, the health care program? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'd have to work that. Like Could you send that to us? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's a lot of money. Um, I mean, and right. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around the concept that their insurance, particularly Medicare, I'm referring to, that it would stop and start. Right. Um, I mean, Medicare requires a premium be paid. Mm -hmm. So how do you stop it? And then all of a sudden the person ends up in the hospital and you start their Medicare. How, how does that work? And I'm wondering how it works for medications. If a person is on a particular range of meds, I'm sure that you're stuck some of them, but not all of them. Who's paying for these medications? If they don't have any insurance at the time that they're- We are. We are. We are. We are. We, are. We, are. Yeah. We, pay for, State. we pay for everything. We pay for everything. So I know that you were saying that seems very high. Medications are very expensive. Yeah. We can find so out we, what the percentage have, of the medications that cost. We have all kinds of pharmacies. Yeah. yeah. We, poly, I mean, the poly subscribe prescribing is, is, is enormous. Um, our, our people are not well. I think what, what um, I'd like to do, and I'll talk to Alice about this, but I know we'll have a debrief in our committee, and I already have a list of questions of data we would like to see from you before we come back to the table. So we'll gather that at that point. We'll work with Alice and her committee and then send you a list and then continue. So I, I think one thing that's really important is when folks are coming into an incarcerative setting, they're very sick. A lot of them have not had medical care. They don't have a provider. They don't have a primary provider. Their medications may be so outdated. And I mean, that's what DOC is seeing is folks who are coming in, they could be 30 years old, 40 years old, but they have the health issues of a 70 year old. Mm -hmm. That's what's happened. That's what people need to understand. Right. The folks that are coming in are not coming in. They're not healthy for the most part. Some are. But the bulk of folks who are coming in have some real sickness. They haven't been to a dentist. They don't have a primary care provider. They don't have medications, or the medications are totally out of date. Or they haven't had the money to pay for the medication. They haven't had the money. They're not on any insurance. They're not on Medicaid. I mean, that's, and then corrections has to pick all this up. They are disconnected. Before they even get into the yes. system. Okay, we have Troy and we have Daisy. I'm going to springboard nicely off Representative Black's question. Um, I want to stay on that per inmate per month rate for just a moment. Um, and I'm curious to know what happens to quality of care as we approach that limit, right? As we start realizing we're close to 
either surpassing or arriving to that to that rate limit. If we don't approach it, I'm curious to know, is there any sort of clause in the contract that refunds the balance back to the state? Either way, I'm really, I'm worried about the motivation to maximize profits for WellPath here and the impact that's having on quality of care. And then the vicious cycle that would create, um, right, when quality of care goes down, um, we can probably anticipate a likely um, added care, more care required, right? So when, when healthcare goes, the, the quality goes down, um, because it's profit motivated, that just leads to chronic illness. So, that's to, so what, who's tracking that per rate and how quickly we're approaching it and what happens when we do surpass it, what happens when we don't surpass it? So um, you are on point with your concerns, but the contract that we have developed does address those concerns and shares the liability of surpassing those costs. So it's not a cap per se, that if, if, an, you know, if they're not calculating the costs of that- but It impacts profit. And there's a, there's a cap on how much WellPath can profit. So they don't profit by withholding care, that's not the way the contract is developed. And I'm happy that we can also follow up by sending you, send you the specific, because I think it's best if you see the language okay. of how we've constructed this, because a tremendous amount of um, work went into this over, um, gosh, seven years of us crafting these contracts with a tremendous amount of legal advice from the AAGs, our own legal counsel and everything. But correct me if I have this, regardless of a, a cap being on profit, profit impacts quality of care, right? They're motivated to, to deliver their care based on the fact that they still wanna make money, even, even, if it's, even if it's capped, right? Does that feel accurate? And it, it is, but the devil's in the details, and okay. I really would like to, sure. to share that information very That's specifically, because yeah. it's all in the legal language of how we track this. Um, the, an the other broad answers I can give to your question um, without being premature and having you look at all of this and then having follow-up conversation about it is that it, the an big answer is yes. If there's money on the table, it comes back to the state. Okay. Um, there are a lot of financial controls every month and every quarter on all aspects of the contract. There are whole facts and almost all sections of the contract. Um, we track all of this very carefully. Um, and Max Titus, who is, my, who is the director of our team and who is my boss, um, that is one of their primary responsibilities in concert with the other team members. Um, so we have a very, robust system to, to track this and to make sure that quality of care is not being impacted by um, any financial constraints and that we have no barriers to accessing care as long as the person assents to it and it is medically necessary. And those are our, those are our you know, lighthouses. Thank you. Easy. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I've learned a lot and it's a pleasure to see you and I know of your work. Um, I'm a member of the PRIN Executive Committee and having come from the Department of Mental Health, I'm very familiar with your somewhat unique role to kind of have one foot in mental health and another in corrections and just have an appreciation for your awareness of the um, some of the struggles that individuals who are being incarcerated um, have, have dealt with. And I'm looking at some of our print surveys um, from 2021, and almost 40% of incarcerated people had experienced seven to 10 um, on the ACE of the ACE categories. And Daisy, maybe, does everyone know what ACE is? Adverse childhood experiences. So this, these are things like witnessing domestic violence or experiencing violence themselves or child abuse and things like that. Um, so we know that they're coming from difficult places. Um, the the PRIN surveys have a wealth of information. They were done at the Southern facility. Um, there was a really high response rate. The, the work of the PRIN committee is excellent, but it's ending. I'd be curious to hear 
Um, and I have a couple questions. One is I'd be really curious to hear, you know, what are your personal hopes for carrying forward um, the input, which was both, um, you know, came from inmates as well as staff. Um, and there's some really shocking um, data in, in, in those surveys. Um, I think around some of the points and themes that have come up in here, um, especially on discharge, um, 89% of inmates said that they disagreed that the prison did a good job preparing them for release. So print is ending, the funding for that project's ending. And this terrifies me that people feel so not prepared, but I'm also deeply appreciative that we asked them. Um, so this data is there. Um, I'm curious what we're gonna do next, and I'm happy that, that you're part of what's to come next. Um, that's my first question. My next is, how can we be involved in, in helping to improve or be aware of the mental health grievances that come up? It sounds like there's a lot of them. I remember that, and I know some of them are um, repetitive or due to you know the own individual's experience and unique needs. How can we see those? Okay, so. Two big questions. Um, start with the first. And, you know, PRIN really, the Prison Research Innovation Network. Innovation Network. Innovative, pr 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 Prison Research Innovative Network, um, for those of you who don't know, um, was a federal grant that um, we were one of six states to receive about four years ago. It's right in the middle of the right before the moment. Yeah, Commissioner Baker was taking over the house to shut. And um, <coughs> Southern State was chosen to be the facility where these activities took place. It was a case of learning collaborative, a high level learning collaborative with the other prisons who were involved in this. The focus on how to improve the culture. And it was a very iterative process almost like appreciative inquiry from the incarcerated level on up to the leadership of, of the facility. Um, having said that, it really, our, our initial thinking and even applying for that grant was because we had already been moving in that direction philosophically at the department. And um, as you may or may not know, um, many of the individuals who you worked with who were incarcerated, were actually part of the group um, of coaches that I started uh, the program back in 2017 called Open Ears. And so, you know, we've been trying to leverage their voices and to create a more civil society within the constraints of a correctional environment for, for quite a while. So I totally appreciate the work that Prim did. And I, I, my hope is that there's enough of a flame lit inside of the department um, where this continues, this movement continues, this focus being trauma-informed uh, of, of hearing the voices of the people that we're serving, because uh, ultimately we're in the customer service business. We're, we're protecting the public. We're doing the job of the courts. We also have to serve these individuals. And the better we serve them, my argument would be that that is the best rehabilitation. How you were treated inside of a correctional facility is ultimately how you will learn to behave when you leave. And if, if we're, we're treating them not with civility and with not, not, not with respect, we're not enhancing the rehabilitation for their return to, the, to, to, to us. So I, I have been looking at, um, I'm, I'm actually working with many people at DMH and in AHS and across the state um, in the open ears training that happens annually. This is a group of incarcerated individuals who provide mental health, substance use, and just recovery from life, peer-to-peer um, -peer coaching. Um, we actually have a segment, at, it's most of a day, on the science of trauma. We don't focus so much on ACEs because that's, kind of a punitive, um, not strength-based approach, but we focus on resilience. So I worked with Dave Malcolm on this, who is the direct clinical director of the Northeastern Family Institute. He is a statewide expert on this area. He's all three school systems. 
And so we have um, a big part of the training is on, on toxic stress, which certainly a correctional environment is that. There are lives that were incarcerated for probably toxic stress. And we talk about the behavior continuum of being completely overloaded on toxic stress, but how stress is also necessary to, to motivate people to do things, to take action. And ultimately, it's about leadership and humanity. So I'm hoping through that education, they are now trained to talk about this with other incarcerated individuals. Pre-COVID, for instance, at Northern, there were over 1,500 individual coaching sessions in one year. So they really do impact a large part of the system. But I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's not happening with the staff from what I am aware of. I understand, mm -hmm. and um, I, I hear you loudly and clearly. Um, there is peer support with the staff, and you know I think there's been a lot of awareness raised through PRIN, as you said, um, the results on the answer about asking about suicidality, et cetera, in PRIN were very impactful. And what we know about any system, any organization, I don't care if it's IBM or it's a correctional facility, Organizations are organized around trauma, and they are, they are parallel processes, especially in a residential setting. And what I mean by that is if you have a psychiatric hospital setting, the staff who are typically doing that work are almost just as traumatized as the people who are inside of the system. So it's nothing that we can ever lose sight of, and correctional officers are just people too, and they have the same types of health issues that people have, probably, if not more. And we know that they also have a higher suicide rate. So, you know, in addition to PRIN, I don't know if you all are aware of, but one of Commissioner Dummel's first acts when he assumed his role was to immediately organize a suicide task force. And an initial report was developed that report was done in concert with a lead researcher, the only researcher in the United States who has done this work, who is at Northeastern University. Um, she developed her scope of work um, because of the extreme level of, uh, I think there were eight in one year of, of suicides in the Department of Corrections in Massachusetts. And so she had been working in concert with that system to take a look at this and build some kind of a bench because there's so little research about this. So that group continues to meet and is continuing to try to address the needs of staff, have a very um, appreciative inquiry style where there are staff who are feeding in and work in work groups who then generate ideas and then that's brought to the, to the, the higher leadership. And people are, are, the commissioner's desire is to empower people to have a voice and to take action to um, tell them, tell leadership what they need. And so very much mirroring what, what Ben was trying to accomplish. You so could, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. We have one last question and then I think we'll be done. Brian? Um, hi. Hi, Brian. We used to work together a long time. Oh. <laughs> um, so you talked about how a lot of people are arriving in the correction system sick. And that's not surprising to me because the social determinants of health are intertwined with the social determinants of crime. And so I'm guessing that the same factors that are making people come to the facilities unwell are the same factors that, that drove them to commit criminal behavior or if they even did, because some people are innocent and get convicted. Um, but that being said, um, I'm curious how you see um, health conditions worsen for people due to the fact that they're simply incarcerated. Because even though you talk a lot about the services that are being provided, research shows that incarceration itself is bad for health. So I'm just curious, and we saw like with the Springfield survey, I believe it was called, that was done at Southern State Correctional Facility that you were referring to, Daisy, um, that people reported that their health worsened. I'm curious if you could say more about how you see um, people's health worsen just due to being incarcerated. I mean, that is absolutely correct. Um, and there is, and I did this research for Isaac, remember I, I can't remember the citation, but there has been some national research on that issue, Brian, and I mean, it's literally something 
on the level of um, for every year, a year in the outside, and this is again like a healthy year, right? For somebody who's not suffering from social determinants, like people who may be likely to be incarcerated or have high ACE scores, as we know that's part of the ACE outcomes as well. Um, one year equals like seven. So if you have like cat lives. So, you know, I know that it's, it's, it's again, it's a public safety issue to um, contain someone who is not willing to address their behaviors that are creating a public safety threat for the rest of us. And yet you are also correct that that certainly does not make them well. And that's what I've testified many times to HCI before is that when people are seriously mentally ill, it is a serious decision to incarcerate them. But right now, it is the only institution that is longitudinal, that has the containment that might be necessary, at least initially, for that person. And we don't have another institution to place them in. So th this, you may not be able to answer this question today. This is a common thing, as you know, when you come talk to the legislature. <laughs> but I, I see this as the beginning of a discussion of our committees working together. Is, is there any data or research that you're aware of that shows different outcomes for people who are living in a secure recovery residential facility, which Vermont has won, um, versus people living in a correctional facility? Yeah, so that's maybe something for us to flag in there. We're going to process this later, so I'm going to save my thoughts about what I want to hear next okay. so that we don't take up Annie's time. So. Perfect. Good to see you. So, <laughs> as you can see, it's really, really, um, I want to say complicated, but not so much complicated as layers. And I've often said about corrections, it's like an onion. You peel off the first layer and it's going to expose more layers and more layers and more layers. So this is the first approach that we've had. We also had with us electronically well pad, um, and we also had the Department of Health, and we didn't get to those folks um, so what's going to happen next? We're not quite sure. Uh, Lori and I will sit down. Maybe we do another joint meeting and pick up <laughs> well path. Um, and we just have to figure yeah, out what's next. What's next. Um, it's going to be so valuable to the corrections and institutions committee to have the health care view to help us. It's going to be really valuable. And I hope for you folks on health care, mm -hmm. information we have on corrections and institutions will be just as valuable to help understand how the delivery of health care services within our correctional facility operates, which is similar but different. Right. Yes, definitely. So we'll figure out how we're going to go forward next. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know. No, I don't think we do. But this was very good. And you obviously are, know um, your work. And so I appreciate that. And I appreciate all your time with us this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So for YouTube, I think we're done for now. Yep. Um, and uh, this discussion will be continued. So thank you, folks.